Our world is full of trash. No, I'm not talking about reality TV or 90% of the content on TikTok. I'm talking about good old-fashioned pollution. The good news is that we caused it and we can fix it. Scientists and engineers around the world have been busy creating a wide range of technologies to clean up the mess we've made. They've created tools to clean up oil spills, get plastic out of the water, and even filter the air at a massive scale. Pollution is the defining challenge of our time, but recent advancements make it seem like it might be manageable. Pollution is usually a cumulative effect that builds up over decades. But there's one polluting event that happens all at once and has catastrophic effects. Oil spills. Fortunately, scientists have created a tool to tackle the problem by getting millions of tons of oil out of bodies of water. It's called the oleo sponge. The oleo sponge is a remarkable innovation in environmental technology. Developed by scientists at Argonne National Laboratory, this sponge-like material has the ability to absorb oil from water making it an invaluable tool in oil spill cleanup efforts. The sponge is made from a special material that selectively absorbs oil while repelling water, allowing it to efficiently soak up large quantities of oil without being saturated. Its high oil absorption capacity and reusability make it a cost-effective and eco-friendly solution. With the oleo sponge, we have a powerful weapon in our fight to protect our oceans and preserve the delicate balance of marine ecosystem. But oil also pollutes our waters in a different form, petrochemical-based plastic. This form of pollution requires a completely different tactic, and some clever people have put an idea into motion. The Ocean Cleanup Project partnered with Team Seas to build what they've called the Interceptor. With this flashy design and catchy name, the Interceptor is well-positioned to bring attention to its work. It navigates rivers and waterways using a clever combination of barriers and conveyors to snatch up plastic debris before it can reach the ocean. It's like a big floating Roomba on steroids, but instead of picking up dust bunnies, it tackles plastic pollution. However, although the approach here is really cool and is definitely making a difference to people who live in areas where interceptors are cleaning up rivers, this tech will not solve our plastic pollution problem by itself. Put simply, we're generating and throwing away plastic faster than thousands of interceptors could ever clean up. But it is a start, and removing even a small percentage of the world's total plastic waste is still a lot of plastic, and we should consider that a win. But even when that plastic is removed, it has to go somewhere. Some of it can be recycled, but plastic recycling doesn't happen nearly as much as it should. Estimates vary on just how much of the world's plastic gets recycled into new plastic products, but the numbers are always less than 20%. So, even though plastic removal tech is important, it's just one piece of a gigantic puzzle, and we have to do more. And that's where some alternative solutions come in. One of the more fascinating options is plastivores. While the word plastivore might sound like some bizarre species of dinosaur, it's actually a term used to describe organisms that feed on plastic. And while that may sound like the plot of a weird sci-fi movie, these tiny creatures are already showing promise in very real environmental situations. In 2016, a group of Japanese scientists went to a recycling facility to collect plastic bottles, and they discovered that a species of bacteria was eating its way through them. This strange little plastic-loving bacterium is called Idionella sakaiensis, and it has developed a taste for a certain type of plastic called polyethylene terephthalate, or PET, PET for short. After analyzing this bacteria, the scientists found that it produced two unique digestive enzymes. These enzymes break down PET plastic into simpler molecules that can then be broken down further to release energy for the bacteria. The discovery of these enzymes has led to other scientists experimenting to see if they can genetically modify other microorganisms to do the same thing, but better. And it turns out somebody actually pulled it off. Researchers at the University of Edinburgh have been using E. coli bacteria to convert plastic into vanillin, the primary component of vanilla bean extract. 
That vanillin is even likely to be safe for human consumption. That might sound kinda gross at first, but consider that most vanilla in the food you eat is actually imitation vanilla, and most imitation vanilla is made from an artificial compound derived from, spoiler alert, petrochemicals. So, in the future, we may address our problem with plastic by replacing it with safer materials, then combine that with using gadgets like interceptors to gather up the mountains of plastic that already exist, and then feed this trash to genetically altered bacteria that poop out enough imitation vanilla to supply the ice cream industry for decades. But even if that happens, and hell, stranger things have happened, we still have to account for the biggest threat to every living thing on this planet, air pollution. Whenever a discussion turns to air pollution, that diva, carbon dioxide, tends to hog all the attention. But there are many more mischievous molecules within the smog we generate every day. The biggest concerns are nitrous oxide, sulfur oxide, and what's called a fine particulate matter specifically the kind that is 2.5 microns or less in diameter. These nasty pollutants can lead to serious health problems. In highly polluted areas like India, a Harvard University study showed that in 2018, fossil fuel pollution was responsible for the deaths of nearly 2.5 million people over the age of 14. That represents over 30% of total deaths in India among people in that age range. In short, the problem isn't just about climate change. The only real, sustainable, long-term solution is to reduce emissions and switch to cleaner fuels. But let's be real, that's going to take decades, and in the meantime, people are breathing toxic air that will kill them. So we need intermediate solutions for heavily populated areas. Oddly enough, one solution might be paint. An Italian company called Airlight is leading the charge for environmentally active paints. Founded in 2013, Airlight has focused on developing paints that help purify the air both indoors and outdoors. Airlight makes use of chemical interactions called photocatalytic reactions. That essentially means that when light hits this special paint, it creates a reaction that destabilizes harmful pollutants and even kills viruses. In 2019, a case study showed just how effective air light can be. The experiment was simple. Paint a London classroom with air light and compare it to a similar classroom without the paint. The testing team took over 85,000 air quality readings over a period of one month. The results were impressive. For the classroom painted with air light, concentration of nitrogen dioxide, a particularly nasty pollutant, was 96% less than in the standard classroom. And the paint reduced those pollutant levels very quickly, up to 88.8% .8 reduction after just 60 minutes. But Airlight isn't quite perfect. A scientific study published in 2017 concluded that although these paints effectively decompose some pollutants, they unfortunately generate and release different toxic compounds. But Airlight continues to score major partnerships with companies like Volkswagen that are using Airlight paint for their ads painted on buildings. So maybe the Airlight scientists figured out how to make their paint safer. Airlight runs an international art project called Air is Art, which pairs street artists with Airlight paint to make public murals that beautify the neighborhood and reduce air pollution in the area. One of the largest of these murals is in Rome, and it's called Hunting Pollution by artist Iana Cruz. The mural covers an area of 1,000 square meters, and Airlight says it absorbs as much pollution as a grove of 30 trees. This has obvious implications for how cities might use paint on buildings, roads, and infrastructure. But it also makes the case for more urban art. In the near future, we could see paints like this in the hands of artists all over the world who enhance their communities with visual, cultural, and environmental benefits. And that's something to be hopeful about.